everyone, this is Dr. Julie Lachman. Today we're going to talk about fertility, PCOS, and hormone balance. I hope this video gives you information to help you empower yourself to take care of your health and your family. Some things I say may be things you haven't heard before, which is great. New information is great. It may go against what your friends or family say. It may go against what some of your doctors may, may believe. Um, but this is based on my experience as well as documented research, and I hope that you find it helpful. So first thing we'll talk about is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is very commonly associated with infertility. Now keep in mind, polycystic ovarian syndrome is a spectrum. Although there's diagnostic criteria, the symptoms lie on a spectrum. So let's go through what it is. It's a hormone imbalance affecting millions of women. So if you or someone you love has PCOS, you know that these women suffer with um, irregular menses, they have uncomfortable symptoms, they may have hirsutism, which is hair uh, on the chin, they may have hair on their arms where it shouldn't be. Um, your big toe knuckle should have hair, but the other four toes should not have hair, so take a look at that. That's a sign of testosterone excess. But fortunately, these are reversible symptoms. PCOS is reversible. In fact, every woman I've worked with has improved. In fact, I had a gal I just spoke with actually and a few months ago, she said, well, how do I know when I don't have PCOS anymore? And she gets her period every month, and she doesn't have cramps or really uh, many symptoms to speak of. So I imagine she doesn't have it anymore. But why would we spend all the money to, to do an ultrasound and prove that? Um, so which we don't really have to because she's not having symptoms. So there are diagnostic criteria, like official criteria for PCOS. And there, you have to have two of the following three. So let me go through those for you. Your doctor may, must see too many eggs on the ovaries on an ultrasound. So what happens is you have your left ovary, or your right ovary if you're looking at me on the screen, and your left ovary, and each one releases an egg every other month. So one month this egg sends out, this ovary sends out an egg, and the next month this ovary sends out an egg. Some women feel the ovary do this, you don't have to, there's no need to feel that, um, but they can sort of tell, you don't have to tell, it's not, it's okay if you don't tell, it's probably better if you don't tell which egg, um, the side, which side the egg is coming out of. So what happens is if you don't release that egg, you will end up with it sitting there as a pearl, as we call it. It looks like a pearl, a little white circle um, of the little egg that didn't get released. And on ultrasound, it actually looks like a string of pearls. You'll see the biggest egg, the most mature egg or follicle that should that should be released, and then littler and littler and littler eggs going from like, you know, July, August, September, October, like the next eggs in line. But in, in polycystic ovarian syndrome, you end up collecting these eggs instead of dispersing them um, for ovulation. So that's the first uh, sign, which would be the string of pearls on the ultrasound. The second sign is excess male hormones in your appearance. This could be the hair on those four other toes that I mentioned. It can be hair on the upper lip. Um, it can be acne as well because acne is a sign of excessive male hormone, testosterone. Um, excess male hormones can also cause male pattern baldness where they lose hair at the top here. It's called androgenic or male alopecia. And then the third sign would be excess male hormones in your lab testing, which is usually testosterone. So if you have two of those three, you can be diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now keep in mind, you might have two out of three of those symptoms, or you may have one out of three, or you may have one sometimes, like acne sometimes, or you may have a couple of hairs here and there where they don't belong, but, but it's very rare. That still puts you on that spectrum, even though you officially can't be diagnosed with it. So what does that mean? At least in my practice, a lot of women I see with infertility are on that spectrum, but they're not bad enough to have the diagnosis of PCOS, or maybe they've never had an ovarian ultrasound. Um, so, so remember, just because you don't have the diagnosis of PCOS doesn't mean that we have zero testosterone or androgenic um, interference with our hormones. We're actually gonna talk about why that happens as well, so keep, keep tuned for that. So now for all women, PCOS or not, we're going to talk about the phases of the cycle. So the women's cycle has two phases. We have the first phase, which is called the luteal, the follicular phase. Why? Because your, your follicle is getting ready to expel its egg, but hasn't done so yet. 
What happens in the follicular phase is the uterine lining grows. It's Think of it like um, you're putting down new carpet. It's growing that nice plush lining, and eventually, if there's an egg and a sperm called a conceptus to get, that come together, it's going to find that nice soft spot to, to grow and build a home. So that's the follicular phase. Now, at around day 14 or 15, we have a spike of hormones called LH and FSH. This is what you can test in an ovulation kit. And then after that, we have the second phase, which is called the luteal phase. Now, lute means yellow. And so, and the reason it's called the luteal phase is because the egg turns yellow in that phase. So important nutrients for the luteal phase include yellow foods or orange foods, carrots, cantaloupe, clementines, and other things that don't begin with a C like peppers. So those are the two phases of the cycle. So we, we say day one is day one that you bleed and day 15 is, is generally ovulation. So during ovulation, one ovary, like we talked about, it spells its egg into the abdomen and then um, you have the fallopian tube which actually grabs the egg and pulls it into the uterus with his little hand. It looks just like those sticky hands that kids like stick on the wall. It looks just like that. It has little fingers and it brings that egg right into the uterus waiting for the sperm. It's collected. And the egg, remember, chooses which sperm it likes best. That's why a woman's unlikely to get pregnant with a baby that's too big for her because her, to deliver because her egg chose the sperm that's right for her. Now, the uterus waits for two more weeks called the luteal phase. And when it realizes there's no sperm and egg, it sheds the uterine lining and that's where we have the bleeding. So what is in charge of these phases is our hormones. Now progesterone is in charge of maintaining that uterine lining during the luteal phase while estrogen was in charge of growing the uterine lining. So estrogen likes to grow things, breasts, fibroids, tumors. It's a grower. It takes skinny little 12 year olds into curvy women. So estrogen grows things. Now progesterone in charge of maintaining the uterus, maintaining the uterine lining second half of the month. So if we don't have enough progesterone, we could have early bleeding, spotting. If we don't have enough progesterone in pregnancy, we could have early bleeding spotting, also known as miscarriage. So progesterone is really important for that second stage of the cycle and for preventing any symptoms that might occur during the second stage of the cycle, including breast tenderness, food cravings, especially for salty food or chocolate, irritability, um, premenstrual migraines, low back pain, cramps, cramps that extend to your legs, um, changes in your mood, even um, PMDD is a disorder that occurs with the cycle. So guess what? There's a progesterone influence. Bipolar disorder I've seen be worse before the cycle. Diagnosed at age 12, 14, 15, sometimes after puberty, that's a progesterone issue as well. So progesterone is super, super important in maintaining the uterine lining, but believe it or not, we actually need a certain level of progesterone to cause LH and FSH to spike during the mid-cycle and cause the release of the egg. So if you have a long cycle, it could actually be because you don't have enough progesterone to cause that mid-phase uh, spike of LH and FSH. So you don't end up releasing that egg. You still have a low level of progesterone all throughout the month. It starts to rise and that actually triggers LH and FSH and the release of the egg. So some, some women with low progesterone have a long cycle, 35 days. It's not normal, gals. It's not. Your cycle should be 28, 29 days, just like the moon. That's where we get the word menses from the moon. Uh, the, the lunar cycle is 28 and a half days, and, and that's kind of where we should be too. So if we don't have enough progesterone, we might actually end up ovulating later. Say you ovulate on day 20, and then you still have your second two weeks of your luteal phase, now you have a 35 day cycle and that's that's not okay um, because it tells me that there's an imbalance probably with a low progesterone. So what is the cause of PCOS? Dun dun dun, drum roll please. Okay, did you know that scientists are actually thinking of changing the name of PCOS from polycystic ovarian syndrome to a name that actually includes the endocrine pathology? So even as far back as 2013, researchers wanted a broader name that encompasses the whole hormone system because the ovaries, you know, polycystic ovarian syndrome, the ovaries are not the problem. That's just the check engine light. That's where we see the problem. But the ovaries are just trying to do the best they can given the nutrition and the hormone and the insulin and sugar and the diet and the sleep and the stress that they encounter. So what is the cause of the problem? 
It's not what you may have thought. What is it? It is not genetics. Now you may say, Doc, my sister has PCOS and so does my mom and her three sisters. And I'll tell you, it is still not genetic because they may have eaten the same things, right? Now we have tendencies. That's true. Absolutely. But if we have those genetic tendencies and then we you know, incorporate on top of them, of those tendencies, the same stressors, we're going to have the same problems. So PCOS is not genetic, and don't worry if every other woman in your family had it, there's no reason you have to have it too, okay? Hope that makes you feel better. PCOS is due to too many androgens or male hormones. So we talked about that, how the androgens, androgens can cause hirsutism as well as um, blood tests, obviously, that would show high androgens. So why are there too many androgens? Why is your body trying to make you into a boy when you're a gal? So PCOS happens from high testosterone, but the testosterone is high because of insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance is a very common thing in America, and it's probably why we have growing and growing levels of infertility in men and women. So insulin resistance means that there's high blood sugar, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. What happens with high blood sugar is in women, it raises testosterone, and in men, guess what? It lowers it. So high sugar and high insulin levels actually do the exact opposite of anything that you would ever want in your body. So insulin resistance is pre-diabetes, and even you know medical doctors know this, and they prescribe metformin for PCOS women um, very often. So we're going to talk about what causes insulin resistance. So Insulin is a hormone that's produced by your pancreas, which is right under your left rib. And when you eat food or you smell food, your pancreas says, oh my gosh, let's get ready. We've got all this food coming down. We've got all these carbohydrates coming down. We need to, we need to distribute that. So insulin is like your mailman, your mail carrier, excuse me. And your mail carrier takes all the mail and knocks on your door or, or opens your mailbox and puts in the mail. So say your mail carrier comes around five times in one day to try to give you mail, you'll be thinking, oh my gosh, go away. I don't want any more junk mail. I don't want any more bills. Leave me alone. And you are resistant to your mail carrier. But we had a holiday when President Bush died a few months ago, and there was no mail on a Wednesday. And I don't know about you, but I'm like, I have packages that need to go out. My patients need their, need their items. You know, I'm waiting for something in the mail. Where's the mail, right? So I missed the mail carrier that day. And your body is the same way. Insulin shows sugar to the cells every time you eat sugar. But eventually the cells become like, really? Didn't you go out last night and have a beer? And then you had some pizza with white flour and sugar in the sauce. And then you had a birthday party. So we saw insulin five times yesterday. We're kind of good. Go away. We're done. We're just not hungry. And so what happens is the insulin is trying really hard to distribute its sugar, but it can't because the cells don't want to see it. So insulin needs to be received. This is your cell. And you have a little insulin receptor, and it's going to catch the insulin as the insulin comes floating by. And the longer you've been without insulin, the more receptors you're going to have and the more ability you're going to have to catch that insulin. But if you see insulin all the time, why are you going to bother to put out a receptor? You just don't, you don't need it. And so that's what happens. The cells become resistant to taking in the insulin, and they don't take in the blood sugar. So now the sugar in your blood is high, but the cells, they're over here starving and they're craving sugar. And that's when you get the sugar cravings. That's when you want that sweet taste after a meal, just that little piece of chocolate. Or that's when in the evening you're super hungry. You know, you've been good on your diet throughout the day, but the evening comes and, and you just, you know, you go for the junk food, right? And so that's insulin resistance. Your insulin is not able to get its sugar into the cell, but yet you, so what happens? your pancreas makes more and more insulin to try to put away the same amount of sugar. But what does insulin do? It causes you to gain weight. So now you have cells that are hungry causing you to crave food, especially sugar, and you have your pancreas making more insulin causing you to gain weight. So what you end up doing is eating more food that has more sugar and gaining weight. And that's a huge part of polycystic ovarian disease, but also heart disease possibly even dementia, which we think is type 3 diabetes of the brain, really serious. So insulin resistance is a huge issue, not just for fertility, not just for women's health, um, even for children who are hungry all the time and crave sweets, uh, as well as for the elderly. So this is a huge issue and is epidemic in our country. I think 
more patients than not in my practice do have insulin resistance. And the first question that I know they have it by answering, by when they answer, is if they crave a sweet after a meal, just a little piece of something, and I know that's insulin resistance. Or if they get tired, if they haven't eaten for a while, or if they get tired after they eat, because now they're having high blood sugar after they eat and low blood sugar a couple hours later. And so they want that quick fix. They want that sugar or they want that um, caffeine, even if it doesn't have sugar, to try and bring that sugar up because caffeine does raise your cortisol level and cortisol um, takes, takes sugar into your blood. So what do you have to do? Anyone with PCOS or fertility issues, you have to change your diet. There's no getting around it. Yes, I have wonderful supplements I can give you that help insulin get into the cell like chromium and vanadium. But if you don't change your diet, it's like you know pouring water into a sinking ship. So for example, if you feel sluggish after eating rice and simple sugars, and then a couple hours later you want that pick-me-up, that is a clear sign of insulin resistance and prediabetes. Typically at 3 p.m., that's why we have, I saw the donut shop, they have like from 2 to 4, now you get this extra uh, extra snack, right? The third meal or fourth meal or something like that sale, right? That's because so many people have eaten something that's too many carbohydrates for them the night before. So it doesn't mean that you're, maybe you had a salad for lunch and you were totally, you know, cool on your diet, but it's something that you ate the night before even just too much food or too late that you ate can cause that 3 p.m. dip the next day. So don't succumb to it. Take some chromium, you know, maybe have a little green tea and, and have something healthy so that you don't have that the next day. I think it's hard for a lot of patients to realize that the food they ate the day before, or the food that they ate is affecting them the next day and they don't put it together. Um, so I'm telling you right now that the food you eat today can affect your blood sugar the next day pretty dramatically. That is a sign of prediabetes. Now, for women, when your blood sugar goes up, not only does testosterone go up, but progesterone goes down. So guess what? You're going to have more symptoms before your cycle. You're going to have more breast tenderness, bloating, irritability. And you don't have to be overweight for this to happen. Trust me. I have very thin ladies with low progesterone all the time. So we don't want low progesterone because now we're more susceptible for miscarriage or for not getting pregnant because I think what happens with some women is they might get pregnant for a day, but they don't have enough progesterone to even maintain that long enough to know that they're pregnant or to take a pregnancy test because they've lost that even in one day. So progesterone is really important, and the way that we make sure we have a good progesterone level is by balancing our blood sugar, not overeating, and making sure we don't have insulin resistance. So anything other than bleeding is abnormal for a monthly cycle. We want to cycle every 28 days, bleeding for three to five days, and that's really it. And I know it's really common to have symptoms. I see the ads on TV, like I'm sure you do. Um, take this for this headache, take this for this cramp. But it, it's very common, but that doesn't make it normal. I mean, cancer is common. Obviously, that's not normal. Um, so many things are co are so common that we almost feel that they're normal. Or they, we feel like, oh, it's, this is my normal headache. Like, no, headaches are not normal unless you hit your head. Uh, th then it would be normal to have a headache. Otherwise, it's not normal to have a headache. And people tell me all the time, oh, this is, it's just a normal headache. No, it's not, it's not a normal headache, just any more than it's normal cramps. So just keep that in mind, okay? So if you have any of the following symptoms, you could have low progesterone. So take note. If you have premenstrual migraines, food cravings before your cycle, especially chocolate, sugar, or salt, or if you're not getting a cycle and you're really irregular, if you crave any of those just all the time, mood changes like irritability or anger or tearfulness, decreased sex drive or interest in your partner if it changes with your cycle, Acne, especially on the jaw or chin line, uh, jawline or chin, this tends to be low progesterone. I see this a lot in women who are trying to get pregnant. Or really, um, back pain, menstrual cramps, back pain before or during the cycle, and cramps that extend down the leg or where your legs feel heavy, especially if you've been sitting for a while or even standing for a while and you feel better when you move around. Patients with low progesterone tend to crave exercise. They'll be my spin class women or my marathon runners. Um, or they'll be so tired that they just can't exercise at all and then they gain weight. Um, they just become very puffy, even water weight. Um, progesterone women can gain. Why? Breast tenderness, bloating, these are signs of retaining water. So if you are overweight and have PCOS, probably some of your weight is actually water. And so we want to obviously address that as well. Um, anything that happens monthly, 
could be cycle uh, could be low progesterone. Like achy joints, for example, could be low progesterone. In fact, uh, all my rheumatoid arthritis patients, polymyalgia patients, any any of these um, symptoms before their cycle, they're due to low progesterone. And what happens is they start before the cycle, but then as the cycle becomes more and more irregular, they end up having the symptoms all the time. And now we have these these diagnoses of autoimmune disease. So in my experience, autoimmune disease in women uh, has three causes, low vitamin D, gluten allergy almost all the time, I'd say 99%, and low progesterone. You've got to have a perfect cycle to get rid of that autoimmune disease. Also, history of miscarriage would be a sign of, obviously, of low progesterone. So we're going to stop there for now, and we'll move on.